Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. That is you. Thanks to all of you, including Paul Thiessen, Ali Sanjabi, AB Puppy, and our lifetime supporter, Doug Inman. On this episode of DTNS, AI is coming to Google Maps. We have more momentum ahead of Apple's Vision Pro launch on February 2nd. And Justin Robert Young breaks down the Kids Online Safety Act. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, February 1st, 2024. Happy February, everybody. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Well, before the show, I had two power outages um, that (laughs) one might say was related to L.A. rain, which we're having. But apparently, I just can't plug too many things into one outlet. So, yeah, that's tech for you. All right. Without further ado, let's get into some quick hits. Comcast will stop using terminology over its Xfinity 10G network brand. Comcast lost an appeal of a ruling that found the marketing term misleading after both Verizon and T-Mobile challenged Comcast's advertising of 10G. 10G references 10 gigabit broadband connectivity speeds. Xfinity doesn't actually offer those speeds. Comcast said the term 10G was to represent 10th gen from Comcast and was found to confuse consumers, unsurprisingly, and seemed to be a way of countering 5G hype generated by wireless companies. One day after Apple's Apple Vision Pro initial release to reviewers, many of them posted a flurry of hot takes post-embargo. Apple has fixed a zero-day bug in the mixed reality headset that may have been exploited by hackers in the wild. Apple released its Vision OS 1.0.2 with a fix for the vulnerability in WebKit, the browser engine that runs Safari and other web apps. Apple said if exploited, the bug allowed malicious code to run on an affected device. It is not immediately clear if malicious hackers use the vulnerability to specifically exploit Apple's Vision Pro. The U.S. Consumer Protection Pro- Product Safety Commission has recalled Snap's Pixie Flying Camera, warning users to remove the battery and stop charging the drone due to four reports of the battery bulging, one fire, and one minor injury. Full refunds will be issued for the entire drone and any batteries owned by customers if the drone is, in fact, returned. The CPSC reports that Snap sold about 71,000 units, so not a ton, but hey, just takes one fire, though the uh, number of drones is fewer since that includes batteries sold separately in some cases. Alphabet CD CEO Sundar Pichai announced that as part of the company's latest earning report that Google subscription services including YouTube Premium, YouTube Music, YouTube TV, and Google One Cloud Storage hit $15 billion in revenue in 2023 with subscriptions up 5x since 2019. Without providing a breakdown of the revenue, the service Pichai did say the company's Google One Cloud Storage service is just about to cross 100 million subscribers. The service originally launched in 2018 starting at $1.99 per month and offering users 100 gigabytes of stores shareable with five people, but has evolved to add extra perks. Meta announced its Quest VR headset line is getting an update to play Apple's spatial video format in 3D video shot in 1080p at 30 frames per second with its V62 OS update, which is also adding PlayStation 5 DualSense or PlayStation 4 DualShock controller support for the Quest and browser support for controllers for game streaming. Facebook's live streaming and expanded hand gesture quick actions are also part of the new update. So let's talk about a little bit of what's going on with uh, Apple here. So Vanity Fair is Nick Bilton as a write-up. Apple was probably holding until the day before the Apple Vision Pro launch. With interviews from Apple CEO Tim Cook, Hollywood producer and director James Cameron, John Favreau, and others within Apple. The point of the story is to highlight the incredible ways to watch TV on the Vision Pro. Yeah, if you've if you've uh, if you've seen this Vanity Fair report, uh, Bilden himself says, "Yeah, I didn't used to be interested. Now maybe I am." Listen to all these, you know, visionaries talking about how the future of how we watch televisions and movies will change with the Vision Pro, and you know that that may be the case. We're definitely not there yet, though. Although 
Apple did today announce that over 600 apps have native support for Vision OS and will be uh, available on the Vision Pro when it launches in the U.S. this Friday. As of this recording, that is tomorrow. Now, that is up a pretty significant amount from the around 150 apps that were natively supported on Vision OS about a week ago. Doesn't mean that iPad apps and iOS apps wouldn't be supported. Many millions of those would be, but... Again, these are just um, these these are apps for Vision Pro specifically. Streaming and sports apps like Disney Plus, IMAX, Max, MLB, NBA, PGA Tour Vision, and Red Bull TV have all been optimized to take full advantage of the Vision Pro's spatial design elements and immersive capabilities. Basically, Apple is uh, leaning very very hard in on this is how to watch content. In the future, if you're a soccer fan, you can subscribe to MLS Season Pass and the Apple TV app as well. With the NBA app, uh, NBA app rather, and an NBA League Pass subscription, for example, Apple says basketball fans can use a multi-view feature to watch up to five broadcasts live or on demand, view real-time stats, scores at a glance, and stuff like that. We have a bunch of other uh, apps that have have come on board to be natively part of Vision OS. We've got Airmail, we've got Box, Carrot Weather. Some of these we've talked about in the past before, but uh, the list is growing. DJ, Fantastical, J Crew, Lowe's, Navi, Night Sky. The list goes on. So, Justin, it yes. does it does seem it does seem as though Apple is saying. We need to win over a lot of developers, and we know this, but what you can do out of the box is watch some stuff in ways that you've never watched before. And I think that's where we're seeing Apple understanding that that's their killer app. That's the one thing that you can buy this, and no matter what, it will blow you away. It seems like in all the reviews that I have read, that is 100% on point. Uh, A lot of the downsides of the reviews are its bulkiness, whether or not the hand tracking always works, but nobody has said that the screen's bad. Nobody has said that the immersive element of it is is anything less than the best in class for a, a, a device like this. And Apple is in the entertainment business. Apple TV is something they've invested a lot in. They uh, essentially put in so much money into their deal with the MLS that they got Lionel Messi to play in a tiny stadium in Miami. And they're going to make sure that you are able to experience what they believe is the best in the world way to experience entertainment on this device. And for something that you're paying $3,000 for, hopefully you can at least get that. Yeah, they they had to make sure that movies look real good on this because the use case right now is that it's going to be folks who had the disposable income to afford these. In the most part, clearly there are some developers who have bought these because they want to develop the the killer app to come out. But for for folks who have it right now, they're going to be watching movies on planes and trains and other forms of transportation. So Apple had to absolutely make sure that that part is 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 just top notch. And from what the reviews are saying. That seems to be what they've done. Now, I am more of a practical person. Okay, what else is this thing for? And it does a lot. You know, it does a lot. The, the reviews I've re- that I've read, the reviews I've watched are actually saying this is arguably the the best VR headset that you know we've ever seen. But it's still kind of there's not not a lot you can do with it specifically because it is a VR headset, other than look at really really cool movies. And, you know, the funny thing is that Apple is trying so hard to say, well, this isn't just a VR headset. This is spatial computing. It does so many other things. However, what it does really well and so many, um, uh, you know, the uh, partnerships that we already have in place are designed to make you sit back, relax and enjoy something in VR. There is nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'm a I'm a Quest fan. I've talked about this at length. Um, I I think VR is extremely cool uh, if you get the app or the experience that's right for you. But uh, but yeah, we're, it will what, remain to be seen um, what, what, how much this this will will uh, win over people who just don't get it. 
Uh, what Apple wants this to be is the iPad experience. People only thought of an iPad as a consumption device initially. It has since blossomed uh, uh, because of the power on it to be a laptop replacement for a large uh, amount of the public. The problem with the Apple Vision Pro is that it's priced as a laptop on your face now. So you better be able to do some work on it. In the meantime, it's a great consumption device. Hooray. So it shouldn't be too surprising that Google is bringing generative AI to Google Maps. Generative AI is pretty much being added to everything. The ability, however, to help users find cool places through the use of language large language models may help Google turn maps into a search engine for places, something the company has been laboring to do for years. Yeah, so most Google Maps users can find directions from point A to point B with uh, the, the, you know, the easiest of ease, right? We're all used to this at this point. Some are familiar with finding fast food places near me, or as I uh, looked on uh, earlier, uh, power outages near me, or uh, <laughs> I don't know, a department store in your area, that kind of thing. New generative AI features, though, would allow a user to ask maps specifically to find what they are looking for, like places with a vintage vibe in San Francisco. So, yeah, so, so, so this is actually really interesting to me because Google, as I said, they, they for years have been trying to figure out how do we turn maps into a search engine? They, they, they've been doing this for five or six or seven years. And now because they're adding VR to every VR, they're adding AI to everything. This is something they're going to add to it anyway, because it just makes sense. They're adding to everything else, but it actually may help maps become that thing they want it to be. Because I look at it, you know, like right now it's, it's hard to search Google for very, very specific things. You kind of have to already know what it is you're looking for. But if I just said, Hey, I, you know, I'd like to pay some free as being a park. Can you show me, uh, you know, I don't want to say the word because my, my, my devices will start <laughs> going off, but you know, you, you say, Hey word, can you show me the vi you know, show me places where I can buy a Frisbee near this park. Mm -hmm. That's not something you really can do today, at least not easily. And I, I see the promise of that with something like adding, adding large, large language model support. I don't know why I get tongue twisted on that to these platforms. What this is good for and will be good for. And let me just also say it's not when it's it's not if this is going to be everything. I, I very much believe that with generative AI, especially with the companies that are going to have to put it in all of their products, we are going to fundamentally look at things like search different by the end of this year than we do right now on the cusp of February. But for maps right now, the, the, the value of this is not even saying anything that you might be using as a search term. It's place for a first date that the large language model knows, okay, for, for a first date, you want something a little fancy, but right. you don't want to spell all that out. If you want to say a great, if I'm uh, on the road, and uh, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers are in a playoff game. Great place to watch a Steelers game. Now it's instead of me searching the web for where the Steelers bar is in that town, it's going to know immediately how to how to find that in, in a way that a SEO world isn't going to be uh, the best at. Well, yeah. And I mean, going back to the whole, you know, example of like vintage vibe in San Francisco, it's like, yeah. you know, Think about that first date. Maybe you know enough about the other person that, like, maybe they'd be impressed by, you know, mm -hmm. this this kind of vibe. But how do you explain that in SEO search terms? That would be really hard or, or a little bit too time consuming. So it's a little bit more of like the instead of saying, all right, well, um, search has to be dumbed down to make it like I want ramen near me. Go. Yeah. You know, and more of like ramen near me, but, you know, warm and, you know, lively and good music kind of thing. You know, you one, know? one of the yeah, one of, one of the biggest things I saw with Chad GPT when that first came out was people that were great at searching and had learned all the tips and tricks of searching quotes and plus and, and all that. You had to unlearn that when you're talking to a large language model. So, for, for example, uh, on the Austin subreddit, there was somebody that posted in there. Uh, I want a steakhouse with Wolf of Wall Street vibes. <laughs> and 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 it and a bunch of people had a bunch of recommendations cuz they know the area. But a large language model will be able to unpack that in a expedient uh, expedient and scalable way. So one of the things I want to point 
one of the things I wanted to point out here is that Google knows that they cannot mess Matt's up. So what they are doing is they're not just going full born to this. They're going to be working with local guides. And that's a community of contributors who write reviews, share photos, answer questions, edit places and check you know, for accuracy of Google Maps. So they're going to be working with them, at least initially, to make sure that people still who, who, who still search the old way are still able to get from point A to P. Um, well, just to uh, remind everybody that all these companies continue to race towards whatever the uh, horizon of AI is, Google also launched a new AI-powered image generator called ImageFX, developed by Google's DeepMind team and underpinned by Image2. ImageFX offers a prompt-based UI to create and also edit images similarly to how you might do on Dolly or Midjourney, Imagine with Meta, and Microsoft Designer. Artificial intelligence is moving fast, and that's why you need to listen to AI Name This Show. Each week, Tristan Jutra and Tasia Custody examine the hype versus reality to keep you informed about the latest news in the AI world. Catch it at AINamedThisShow.com. Yesterday, the CEOs of Meta, X, TikTok, Discord, and Snap all faced allegations by U.S. senators that their platforms were harming child safety and raising questions about what they could be doing and doing differently. One of the more eyebrow-raising things to come from the session is official support that Snap and X and Microsoft gave for COSA. That stands for Kids Online Safety Act. Critics contend the bill could allow censorship of uh, important self-harm and suicide prevention material and could also be used to target LGBTQ content. All right, Justin, I know you've been following this closely, so where oh, are yes. we? Well, before we get into COSA, I do just want to highlight what I think probably the majority of the clips that folks who are listening to this show saw about this hearing online, because it was not only the typical grandstanding that you see in Congress, it was especially circus-like. Many of you have seen a clip of a senator asking leading questions to the TikTok CEO, something that we saw a lot of last year. Lindsey Graham, Republican senator, compared social media to guns and cigarettes and said that blood was on the hands of all the CEOs. That's charged language, even for Congress. And Josh Hawley, senator from Missouri, got Mark Zuckerberg to stand up, turn around, and apologize to uh parental rights and, and, and children's advocates that were there in the hearing room. This wasn't just animated. It was animated beyond the level that even I was expecting. And the reason why I wanted to highlight this is just to point out to people that part of the reason from the political side that this happened is because there was a hearing a couple months ago where a Republican Congresswoman, Elise Stefanik, asked charged questions to presidents of Ivy League institutions. They answered those incredibly poorly. And two of them are now no longer presidents of those institutions. So there is blood in the proverbial water when it comes to grandstanding. And I, I just want to highlight to people that that's part of the reason why things got animated as they did. Yeah, it was definitely very performative. <laughs> yes. Very, very, very performative. Um, I would also say this. I don't think that any of those CEOs have to worry about their jobs like maybe those uh, college no. presidents did uh, because it looked clownish at times because uh, I, I actually watched. I didn't watch it from beginning to end, but I probably, you know, took a look at a probably a good 30 minutes of clips. And it's like, OK, uh, at some point, though, they're you know, our, our government is going to have to figure this out. There are real dangers here. Um, the, the tension is high, you know, the, you know, everybody's fever is elevated. They've got to figure this out. So, you know, so they've got to get beyond the, I don't want to say name calling, but it kind of, it kind of did dip into that, you know, at some point they've got to get beyond that and actually, okay, here's what we can do to actually ag agree on some type of compromise to where we are going to do something to make it better than what it is right now. Well, cause also right now they're in a very, very easy spot. Yeah. When, when we were saying the blood is on your hands, then, OK, so what are you going to do? What are you asking them to do immediately, aside from saying your product has an undue negative influence on teenage girls? OK, well, what is their solution or what is your solution in, uh, in terms of the government? With that being said, 
let's look at the specific law or the specific bill that is going around, and that's the Kids Online Safety Act. Uh, scope wise, what the what COSA does is targets co- uh, covered platforms such as social networks that connect to the internet and are likely to be used by minors. The bill exempts certain entities like internet service providers, email services, and educational institutions. It mandates that covered platforms provide minors uh, or their parents or guardians with settings to restrict access to minors' personal data. Parents or guardians must also have tools to supervise minors' use of the platform, including control over privacy and account settings. Covered platforms are required to disclose information about the use of personalized recommendation systems and targeted advertising. The bill prohibits platforms from facilitating advertising to on age-restricted products or services like tobacco and gambling to minors. It requires platforms report foreseeable risks of harm to minors using the platform, creates a duty to act in the best interest of a minor, and also has research ac- access, uh, control and limitations, and independent audits. None of that is particularly controversial. What is controversial is this. The threshold of what harm to minors is defined as. And that's where not only free speech advocates, but also some of the platforms that have not signed on to that are blinking a little bit because they want something far more detailed that can't be stretched. So now all of a sudden the platforms get dinged for something that they otherwise wouldn't have. And they feel did not have a, a an ability to look out for or might fall under some of the gray areas that were brought up earlier. Suicide prevention. Uh, uh, LGBTQ plus issues and specifically some of the more controversial elements of our modern world, including uh, uh, ch- children's trans health care like that. That's those are issues for which we have tremendous divide in terms of belief on whether or not that is considered harm. And the platforms don't want to have to play referee on that if they don't want to. And they would not like to be forced to do it by the government. Well, and there are other issues, not exactly these issues, but that have come up in the past, you know, such as no nudity. And it's like, well, what about a mother that's breastfeeding type thing? Or what about, you know, someone who is trying to raise awareness for breast cancer? Uh, You know, there are lots of gray areas that an algorithm is just not going to get right. Um, Case by case, sometimes the company can say, yeah, yeah, sorry, Uh, you know, let's let's do things a little bit differently. We're learning as we all are, you know, going forward. I think that's the biggest issue really here is that you have these huge, huge, huge money making platforms saying we're doing our best. We don't want anybody to get hurt here. We don't, you know, want anybody to have a bad time here. Um, but they don't exactly know how to fix all of this stuff. It is, it's, it's a long process. Now, I'm not saying that the, you know, some of these companies couldn't do things differently because very clearly there have been some huge missteps, which is why we're in the situ- situation that we're in right now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, as we, we, we mentioned this on, on yesterday's show on DTNS, is like the whole like one-size-fits-all thing simply just doesn't work in any case like this. I I think one of the things that companies aren't going to say this, but this is what they want. Legislators, legislators tell me what the law is so we can apply it and, and, and basically run our organization by what you say the law is. Stop making us try yeah, to so figure out what's fined. best um, so that you can basically waffle, you know, to, we went too far, we didn't go far enough. You tell me what the law is, let me actually apply the law that you actually write as compared to trying to make us figure out how to, how to solve this problem. Like, so they're not going to say that, but that's where they want to be because that, that gives the company cover. If, if, if the company says, well, this is what the law is, we are abiding by the law. If there's a problem with that, go talk to your congressperson and, and get it changed. Like I said, once again, they're never going to say that, but th- there's no question that back in some of these boardrooms, those are conversations that don't necessarily get recorded in the notes that are happening. Oh, there's a reason why a lot of these companies have signed on and they're the bigger companies because there's also an element of regulatory capture to this. If, if, Apply, if complying with these laws requires a lot of staffing or requires more money to set up a more sophisticated algorithm to track stuff, then the larger companies are going to want to do it because they know that it'll be harder for competitors to come in onto their corner. 
I don't think that this is going to be done anytime soon. I think a lot of the stuff here is fairly commonplace, but anything that deals with free speech on the internet is going to face stiff resistance. And until you see some of the folks sign on that have not, and I'm mostly circling meta here, then there is going to be fight back and negotiation from the lobbying side. Absolutely. All right, let's check out the mailbag, Rob. So Matthew chimed in on our GDI story from yesterday on generative AI in the fashion industry. And he writes, I've worked in the footwear and apparel industry for almost 20 years. Production timelines typically run between 12 and 36 months, with buys getting locked in 6 to 12 months before things hit the market. Agencies are mostly doing supply chain analysis rather than actual forecasting. Pantone's color of the year isn't some type of intricately researched guess. It's known because they can simply look at the chips and formulas they sold two years ago for uh, the current production year the fall sweater or should say the fall sweatshirt and sweatpants uh, was known issue and it was locked uh, because fabric vendors and orders were locked in the same way that Ming-Chi Kuo predicts Apple movements with chip suppliers. These agencies have a direct access to many companies, vendors, etc. They are also packaging known things in smaller play- to smaller players. They are incorporating AI and machine learning solely because the entire footwear and apparel industry is unbelievably risk averse right now. And to be truly, uh, you know, you know, to be truly innovative and trend forward requires a large investment. And nobody wants to do that unless the return is guaranteed team, which it never will be. The industry would rather trust poorly constructed quantitative data than well researched qualitative data. AI and machine learning is a way for the industry that has seen a qualitative position to change itself into a quantitative one. Oh, Matthew, that is such good intel. Thank you. Really for writing good, in. Yeah. I never knew that about the Pantone thing. I always just thought it was it was like a big stab in the uh, uh, you know stab in the dark, but that makes a lot of sense. No, it absolutely is not. So personal experience on this. I have a friend who actually works in the fashion industry, and that was one of the things she would always say is like, "You guys think that these trends are coming out like it's just somebody said something. This is cool for the spring." And it's like, no, we, we knew that was cool two years ago. Um, yeah. I, I remember distinctly having those conversations. So what Matthew is saying here absolutely confirms that. I mean, I made a, um, a a joke about Devil Wears Prada yesterday, but it's like, <laughs> that is a, re- if you haven't seen the movie, I hope I don't spoil it, but um, uh, Meryl Streep goes, goes through a very long, like, you're wearing this blue sweater because five years ago something happened and it all trickled down to the point where you're wearing this blue sweater we all know what we're doing, and it's been going on this way for a very long time. So, yes, um, yeah. again, Matthew, thank you so much for that intel. Um, we also got an email from Kevin from Milwaukee who chimed in on our future of TV conversation we had with Charlotte Henry from Tuesday's show. Kevin says, "The I just want some background noise that Sarah brought up while watching TV is a real thing. And one of the reasons that my wife and I like cable. On cable, we can always turn on Big Bang Theory and then do whatever. It's a great show. It's always entertaining. We've seen it so much, we don't need to concentrate on it. I would love a way to go to Netflix, select multiple TV shows, and then maybe a weight distribution for each show to create a channel that I can just let play. We flip on the Food Network for the same reason. Someone else is curating a random list of programming. It's very contrary to the current binge-watching style, but I would like support for some sort of replay channel. Now, uh, Matthew, uh, sorry, Kevin and uh, Tom went back and forth on email, and Tom said, have you heard of Pluto TV? Which Kevin had not. Um, Kevin, if you're (laughs) enjoying Pluto TV, which is just one way to have a curated list of cable-esque without being cable channels, ad-supported, of course. Um, yeah, that, that would be, it would be great for you to, 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 to weigh in on later on. But, um, but yeah, it, it was, I was talking about watching reality television saying, all right, everybody, <laughs> I get it. I get what it is. I know what I'm doing, but I just want something on in the background sometimes when I'm making dinner or folding clothes or whatever. And that's, you know, that is the promise of cable that I think a lot of the, you know, the cord cutting solutions still seem like overly complicated to replicate. Yeah, these uh, these fast or free ad supported television um, services like Pluto, like Samsung TV, uh, Tubi TV. I mean, there, there are a myriad of them out there, but they are awesome. I, I absolutely love Pluto. And I would say that probably a good 15, 20 percent of my watching 
is on Pluto because where else can you go and watch Riptide followed by the A Team <laughs> followed by Knight Rider, uh, you know, for 12 hours a day of each one of those programs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, full disclosure, I worked for Pluto TV for a little while back in the day, but um, yeah. It, it's it when I you know would would uh, tell people like oh here's what I'm doing you know, just log in and like get a sense of it they'd be like this is so awesome wow yeah. cool and I just don't have to think about it you know not everything <laughs> television or movie related needs to be mind numbing but for those of us and Kevin I think you're with me on this sometimes sometimes uh, there there are quite a few options you might not have known about that uh, does exactly what you're looking for. Um, Justin Robert Young, you always bring the knowledge that we're looking for, so thank mm. you for that. And thank let you. folks know uh, where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Well, I will be back on the campaign trail tomorrow. I'm heading out to Nevada, where there is both a primary and a caucus next week for the Republicans, and one of them counts, and the other will assign the delegates why is all that the case well in my episode next week i will tell you it is the legacy of uh of, of political legends desire to shake up the calendar a man who died before he was able to see the fruits of his labor that was misappropriated go ahead and subscribe now politics 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 wherever you find your podcasts indeed well, patrons, you know that our show doesn't end here. Good Day Internet rolls right along after we wrap up DTNS. Today we're going to be talking about new features for Threads, the X or Twitter or whatever you want to call it competitor, that makes it yet more like X or Threads. But just a reminder, you can catch our show live Monday through Friday. We are live at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2100 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tomorrow, it's going to be a fun day. We're back talking about the Apple Vision Pro release with none other than Terrence Gaines and Nika Monford of Snob OS Podcast and Eileen Rivera, who happens to be my new co-host on Apple Vision Show. We'll talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>